Welcome to the podcast, everybody. I'm here with my friend, Michael Kitsis. Very excited about this conversation. Uh, we are not going to do a two and a half hour podcast. Uh, oh, I do not have his stamina. I know, man, I know. But uh, but it'll be packed with great stuff. So, Michael, thanks for being here, brother. I appreciate it. it. I will admit it is still my goal to at least be the longest podcast that you've had, even if we don't go two and a half hours. Like I there's a lot of good stuff to talk about. Like, I just I don't know how we shorten it too much. I agree, man. Yep. But I, I want to publicly thank you. I know you had me on your podcast a couple of years ago. Yeah. Great experience. Awesome. Um, awesome. Kind of launch padded some really cool things we've been doing with advisors. And um, so we awesome. are we use you as a model here with what we're trying to do in the industry. So. Oh, I appreciate that. And again, loved the story that you were able to share on the, just the the growth story. And as you've done so on, I think a lot of a lot of advisors still struggle with just that figuring out how to articulate what that value is. Like, how do I translate that value into, you know, like, this is what you'll get out of the relationship. Like, this is what I'm going to create for you. Uh, just, I loved how you framed the conversations on the podcast. I'm so glad to hear it's just, it's continuing to grow and compound for you. Yeah, no, we're, we're definitely passionate about that mission still. So, but I mean, before we dive in, let's assume somebody just listens to the first 20 minutes of this and I want to know, like, what's Michael excited for next year? Like, what what is the biggest thing in your world that you're saying this is this is something I'm I'm pushing, put all my energy into? Oh man, like from the from the personal business end, or like from the industry personal at large? Personal business, yeah. More I, people people always want to know more about Michael. So, uh... oh, so per, personal business end uh, is a lot of the growth work that we're doing just on the kitsis.com platform right now. You know, for a lot of people that followed the blog or followed the podcast, just kind of like. They knew it as the platform of me, of Michael. Like, you know, it was the Nerd's Eye View blog. I was the nerd. It was my view um, on a blog. And the reality now is the platform has grown quite a bit over the past several years. So there are 22 people behind the scenes that that make the business happen now across not just the blog and the podcast, but uh, the live virtual summit events that we do, the courses that we put out for advisors, uh, a, a very fast growing CE offering as well, particularly now that States are rolling out their IARCE. So like we have to help people with that on top of the CFP, on top of the CFPA, on top of the American College designations and all the other stuff. So living living that world of not just the blog and content, podcast content that we do that we'll continue to do and I love putting out, but uh, have been really building a lot of just the core education business behind the scenes in nice. supporting advisors with kind of our particular nerdy flavor, which is a lot of that Either the the focus on just the technicals, like how do you actually drill down to uh, uh, to give the right advice in certain areas, or our summits, which is kind of our our take on practice management events, which is actually not like I'm going to tell you what you should be doing, but I'm just going to show you some cool stuff that other advisors are doing, so you can see what's possible, and like you can decide for yourself what you want to do, what fits for you, right? As I always joke, you put a hundred advice in a room, you get a hundred different ways of doing business, so. Almost none of us copy exactly what anybody else does because we all want it in our own flavor. But it really helps sometimes just to see like exactly what other advisors are doing. And so we really took a different approach with our summits to say like, no consultants, no vendors, no one's going to tell you what you should be doing. We're just going to show you some other things that advisors are doing that's successful and working for them. And that sparks some ideas for you. That's fantastic. Go figure out what your version is of that. That will be successful for you in your practice. So We've been doing these for a couple of years now, but the the coming year is just going to be more summits, more courses, um, more content we're putting out on that end, and just a lot of work that we're doing behind the scenes to really get ready to scale up for the next stage of growth from our end. So it's actually going to 2023 will be a big year of just some technology investments behind the scenes. We've got to re-architect the whole backend database that powers all this yeah. stuff to make sure that we can handle the next stage of, of growth. So it's not the, you know, that end, that end of the business, I guess, apropos to some of the themes of the podcast, like that's not the most exciting, like sexy stuff. Say like, here's the awesome new thing I'm rolling out. It's like, yeah, we're going to rip out the back end and spend like a year re re-architecting it from scratch. But sometimes like that's what you have to do for the business. And so it's going to be a relatively significant pause year for us on revenue growth. We'll still grow some, but not nearly what we did for the past two or three years, but it's doing the internal work on the business that's necessary to set the foundation because I'm super excited about the growth we're going to be doing in 20, 2024 and 2025 off of the foundation that we're rebuilding in the coming year. Oh, that's great. I mean, it, it's the adage of you know, what got you here isn't going to get you there. 
And I think a lot, I see a lot of advisors struggling with that where it's like, Hey, it kind of works. I, I make enough money. And sometimes we go in and say, Hey, let's tear it down and rebuild it because more of the same thing is you've, you've kind of hit your capacity. Well, to me, it it's all a capacity, like it's all a capacity constraint just for anyone that's lived the, like the, the business owner founder journey. And I mean, I've done this a couple of times now of, you know, growing your supply network, growing advice pay, growing the kids.com platform, new plan recruiting, FP Pathfinder, like, yeah, even outside of the advisory firm where, you know, the original firm I was at, I didn't found, but I showed up when we were under 200 million. I was there when we were over 2 billion. I lived a 10 X growth cycle at that business as well. And just, there's an interesting dynamic that comes that as businesses just keep growing, you hit natural capacity points in the business. There, there's one where you can't handle any more clients. Then there's one where you can't handle any more direct report employees. Uh, then there's a couple others as the business gets larger and more complex. And one of the, just the biggest takeaways for me, I feel like one of those, I wish someone had told me when I started down the entrepreneurial journey is how much your business requires you to change. Wow. To adapt to the needs of the business it's kind of like it's like a very lopsided needy one-way relationship <laughs> that you're stuck in uh and the point at which i see most advisory firms stop growing or struggle is essentially when you get to the point where you're not willing to change anymore wow and like sometimes it's because you don't think you can change sometimes it's like look i I make pretty good money it like the business is in a good place like that's cool like if you're where you want to be and you're in your happy place like hang out in your happy place. But that is when the growth generally stops. And if you try to grow past that point without being willing to change, then then things start breaking. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. your time goes up, your happiness goes down. Uh, uh, you start getting turnover problems. You start getting attrition problems. Like everything starts feeling like a mess all the time. Uh, then you got to figure out how to right size it, which is an even less pleasant process. But that dynamic of, there are just very natural capacity points that happen in any growing business. And if you don't realize what they are and you're not cognizant of them and you're not ready to change when you whack into one of those growth capacity walls, it it will flatline the growth of your business. Uh, and again, if you're happy with where it is, that might be fine. But if you're wired for growth, you have to keep changing in really material ways or the, just the 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 business gets stuck. Yeah, and I've seen it, like even when I coach individual business owner clients, it's almost you have to learn to live in a tension. Like the tension is like, it's never solved. Like it's never easy street. And it's almost yeah. change is constant. You never know when you're going to come in and all of a sudden the key person says, hey, I'm moving to, to Florida. And if you're thrown every single time, like surprised, yep, you can't handle it. Like it's going to cripple you unless you're like, this is just part of it. It's hard. I have to change. And then you almost learn, and I'm learning this later on in my business to stop fighting that. And you yep. just kind of fall into the flow. And I think a lot of advisors at times, like giving stuff away, because how much stuff you've had probably to give away so far in your progression. I don't know. Did, how hard did you fight that? Or did you just naturally want to give stuff away? Um. So I guess it was a blend for me. I, I naturally wanted to give stuff away, but... I always had a really clear focus on how to still make it work from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a little bit unique to my business, although there are, there are some parallels to this in, in, in the advisor business. So it's so a little context for me. Uh, so I was a uh, computer science nerd growing up. Like my parents were both computer scientists. Uh, it's only kind of a sheer unfortunate fluke that I did not end out in the tech world instead of the financial services industry. Uh, but I was a gamer. I've been a gamer all my life. A uh, uh, little bit less time to do it now, but I get, <laughs> I get in when I can, when I can. Uh, so one of the interesting phenomena from the gaming world, particularly mobile gaming world. So many of us, most of us probably have lived the wide range of games that have microtransactions. Like nominally you play for free, but then like you play too much. And you hit some kind of wall. And if you want to get over the wall, you got to pay a little money. Like maybe uh, it's a fighting game and you got to pay for better equipment or like it's Candy Crush and you want to refresh your attempts, whatever it is. Yep. And most of us look at those games and are like, yeah, this is fun. But like, I'm not spending money on it. It's a freaking mobile game. Like, no, I'm not spending money on this. Then a few of us are like, 
you know what? I make good money. If this is how I get my entertainment and like the yep. game wants to get 10 or 20 bucks out of me, you know what? Like this is a rounding error on my income in the grand scheme of things. It's not like I'm spending this every hour. Like yep. sure. Uh, they can have 10 or 20 bucks from me because this game has entertained me and it's fun and I can afford it. Yep. And then a small subset of people are all in hmm. and they will spend thousands of dollars on these mobile games. Hmm. Uh, a very small number because unfortunately they may have some slight kind of gaming gambling dynamics, but, but the truth for most of them is it, it's not, be, it's not because they're like doing this and bankrupting their family. It's doing it because they're people who have very, very significant means. And the same way that, you know, some of us are like, yeah, it's not really a big deal. Like drop 20 bucks on this. Like, it's not big deal to like drop a hundred plus dollars on a really nice bottle of wine from time to time. There's a subset of people out there. They're like, you know what else is not a big deal? Dropping a thousand dollars a month on a mobile game. I'm really into right, Yeah. Uh, Cause you know, I make a half a million dollars a year and this is my entertainment. Yep. So, uh, right. So just uh, when you take how wide income ranges, there's a subset of people that can drop what to most for human beings is a lot of money. And to them is a reasonable entertainment cost for a game. Yep. Now, the reason why this matters is from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. When you look at the business of most mobile games, most mobile games basically make more than 100% of their profits from about 2 to 4% of their users. Interesting. Okay. And it's not uncommon in those games that 80 plus percent of the people spend zero. Okay. Like 80% spend zero, 15 to 17% spend a couple of bucks. And a few small single digit percent spend so much money because they've got a lot of money to spend yeah. Uh, yeah. that it funds the entire game. Okay. And so I have actually always taken a version of that approach in how we built the platform as well, uh, which is to say, look, there's a lot of people out there. Like, I publish information on the Internet for free. So there's a bajillion people out there who are just going to read information on the internet for free. It's cool. We put it out there for free. I mean, we've got the metrics, like 200 plus thousand people come to kitsis.com every month and read stuff. Hmm. Some small percentage of those then say like, this is really cool, but I'd like to go deeper. Mm -hmm. Well, cool. Like we have a course on like diving deep into a tax return. Like we have a summit on marketing and how to scale peer. Like if you like this marketing article, we have a summit on this. Or like, mm -hmm. oh, you want to go a little deeper? Like we can actually help you solve your CE obligation with this. Now, if I look relative to the platform uh, uh, overall, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm thinking I'm thinking rough rough numbers for our site visitors. Like about four or five percent of our site visitors pay us for something in any particular year. Okay. It's about about 10,000 advisors that buy various things on the platform, member sections, summits, courses, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Now that's enough to run a 22 person business that's growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. Even though economically we give away 95% of our stuff for free. And actually by content, it's more than 95%. You know, we'll publish a hundred articles in a year. We run two summits and two courses. So like, <laughs> by actual content quality, we give away like 99%. Okay. By pet count, 95% of the people that use our platform use it for free. And it's fine because we do make enough from the last 5% to make it worthwhile. Now, in the media business, we do this with large numbers. So, yep. you know, uh, uh, 200,000 people come and 10,000 people do something uh, that engages with us on the site. If, you know, in the advisory business, obviously, we don't run those kinds of numbers. But it's still a similar dynamic, which is to recognize that just, you know, the hard reality is in most businesses, the majority of the economics come from a small subset of people that are willing to pay the most and value it at that level. Right. And I, like we've all heard versions of the uh, the 80 20 rule in the Pareto principle that that, you know, 80 percent of the revenue comes from 20 percent of the clients, like 80 percent of the profits come from 20 percent of the uh, the 20 percent of that segment. And so. That same principle holds very, very much in advisory businesses as well. We're actually in the midst of finalizing a, uh, 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 the latest version of our financial advisor productivity study. We do it on the Kitsis platform every two years, probably out by the time the uh, uh, folks are hearing the podcast here. 
And we see a same thing when we just actually drill into advisor metrics and economics. Single biggest predictor of advisors' economic success is the average affluence of the client that they work with. Wow. Yeah. I know that's not like a sexy thing. We want to hear it's like the advisors that do this super cool technology and serve like a bajillion mass market folks and to figure out how to do super lean and and, and cool with tech. And yeah. right, there's some people that made some very reasonably profitable businesses by doing that. Like you can make a good living serving mm-hmm. a lot of different people. Yeah. But at the end of the day, just when you drill down to the advisors that have the highest uh, productivity metrics, like the most revenue per advisor, the most profitability per client, the most take home pay. Mm-hmm. It's the advisors that work with the people that are able to write the biggest checks and create value that's meaningful for people who write those checks. It, yeah. it's, it's ultimately a dynamic of, of moving up market. And so we won't necessarily do like the free work for a zillion other clients to get to the few people that are uh, higher net worth. But the economics of an advisory business is really in that same phenomenon and dynamic with the added sort of asterisk, like, we are we are in the money business. Like we are at right. the place where, where money is. So like it's exactly. it's if you're trying to find people who have a lot of money, it's good to be in the money business. Like that's a good way to <laughs> to find the business opportunities. Yeah. So, so what, would you, anyway. what, what would you say to the advisors? Cause because there are the top portion, you know, and I I'll, I'll go to conferences or trips and it's like, okay, these people are in you know a different category where most advisors it's hard to even comprehend the revenue they make or the assets they manage. <laughs> There's also this the, maybe the bottom twenty, which may may not survive. They're not making enough. There's not viability. But a majority yep. live in that middle. That without you know, I'm a thirty year old advisor in a town. I, I can't go to the fifty million dollar client and convince them to leave their advisor. What would you say to them about is there is the industry shifting to where the probability of them being successful is better? Whether it's people are getting better just charging for advice and it's not just an AUM bigger better clients all the time. How does somebody well, so, not get defeated by that? Uh, well, all right. So I'd answer that a couple ways. I mean, first, just I would know, like, moving up market can happen a lot of different ways. At the purest sense, moving up market in this dynamic is about getting more revenue per client. Nice. By whatever means you charge. Revenue. So flat fee, retainer fee, planning fee, AUM fee, like whatever it is. It's not actually, a, it doesn't have to be about assets, although that's a straightforward path that a lot of us take. Yep. Ultimately, just about the revenue that you generate per client. And if you think about it at the most basic level, like advisors are a service business. Service business, you get paid for your time. Now, most of us don't charge by the hour. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, I can take how much revenue you're responsible for, and I can divide it by how many hours you work. And I can figure out what your hourly rate is. Right, Roughly 2,000 working hours in a year. You're doing 300,000 gross revenue production. You're equivalent of $150 an hour. Now, to be fair, not 100% of our working hours go toward clients. It's, you know, 50 or 60% of our hours usually is about the best you can do because you got compliance, professional development, management, other in-office administrative things you got to deal with. But you can you can figure out that hourly rate. If I time adjusted for like truly productive hours that uh, that advisors have, you still tend to end out in a like 250 to $350 an hour is actually really common when I, when I just drill down with an advisor and do the math like, What's your revenue? How many hours? How many working hours are actually client facing? Divide B into A. And it's like, well, there you are. Got it. Now, if I'm working with really affluent clients, you know, I'm 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 working with a decamillionaire. My fee is significantly higher. At least we'll do this in the AUM context for now. Like my fee is significantly higher. Now, realistically, I have to spend more time with the $10 million client than I do with a $1 million client. Yep. It's not 10x though. Yeah. But now to be fair, my fee schedule is probably graduated. So I don't charge my $10 million client 10x while I do my $1 million client, but I probably charge them 5x the fee, mm-hmm. <laughs> even with breakpoints. It doesn't take me 5x the time. And what that means in practice is if I calculate the fees that I'm generating with the same amount of time, like I don't I don't get to create more time. We all have the same 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week. Effectively, when I move up market. And I'm generating more revenue per client. I'm generating more revenue on my time. My equivalent hourly rates goes up. So if you look in the wirehouse realm, the average wirehouse advisor does about $1.1 million of gross revenue. Just public data if you pull out like the Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley statements. If I'm doing $1.1 million of revenue, I'm averaging $550 an hour on my time. 
Mm-hmm. And to be fair, again, since I don't really work all 2,000 working hours, I'm probably averaging more like $800, $900 an hour. Mm-hmm. So how do wirehouse advisors generate more revenue than a lot of advisors in the independent channels? Wirehouses have done a pretty good job attracting the ultra high net worth folks because, yep. you know, there are as much as some folks in the independent channel like to bash the large wirehouses. The reality is there are a lot of people with really large checks or really large net worths who trust national global brands like they yep. they really do like our industry likes to fight this fight fight amongst each other and shoot shots at other channels but just you look at the consumer flows like morgan stanley has i think more than four trillion dollars schwab has twelve thousand rias and it doesn't have four trillion dollars in its advisor channel it's like morgan stanley almost as large as basically all the independent rias combined Wow. And that's just Morgan. And then you put like Merrill and UBS and uh, and Wells Fargo in there. Like wirehouses are huge and they have a lot of really high net worth folks. How do wirehouse advisors get to the income and revenue levels that they do? They're essentially commanding a higher premium on their time that they can generate by working with people who have enough dollars and have enough complexity that they can pay $800 an hour for yeah. financial advice. Right. And just if I want to be an eight hundred dollar an hour advisor, at some point I have to work with people who can write eight hundred dollar an hour checks and have eight hundred dollar an hour problems. Yeah. Now, relative to the question that you'd asked, then to come down a little more practical level, because most folks are going to be listening to this thing like, well, you know, my average client right now is three hundred fifty thousand dollars, but like ten million dollar clients sound great. How do I get me one of those? <laughs> uh, yeah, sounds great. How do I make that happen? In practice, the way this happens is incrementally. It's not about how you get from a $350,000 client to a $10 million client. It's how you get the average from 350 to 500 to 600 to 700 to a million to 1.2 to 1.5 to two. And you move up and you move up market incrementally, gradually over time. Yes, every now and then there's an advisor who's like got some amazing natural gifts and they just know how to get bajillionaires out of the gate. Yep. I was never one of those. I don't know very many people like that. If that's you, like you don't need to listen to this podcast or you're going <laughs> to, like, you can do other things. Kudos to you. Uh, for the rest of us mere mortals, like those people don't drop out of the sky and that's not my natural social circle. Yep. So you don't try to go there all at once. You try to get there incrementally. And so the way I would encourage if I was to think about this from a practical perspective, the primary thing that blocks you from getting there is that you don't have the capacity. Well, so I guess two things. You're not really built to serve those clients. As much as we like to lob some things in the industry of like $10 million client doesn't take 10x the work, like they do take more work. They do have higher service expectations. They do have higher expectations around your expertise. They do have higher demands. It's not perfectly linear, which is why you can make a little bit more money moving up market, but they do have higher demands and expectations, which means trying to turn your firm that works with the mass market into the ultra high net worth overnight, like it doesn't work. You're not ready to serve at the level that they want. And frankly, you have too many clients that don't want what they want to give you the time and capacity to do what they want to do. Yeah. The way you get there is incrementally. So the most basic way to think about this is if you want to get there, calculate. so take your total revenue, mm-hmm. divide by how many clients you have. That's your average revenue per client. From now on, you're not allowed to take anyone below that number. You're just not allowed to take anyone below that number. By definition, they're a below average client. And if 28% of your profits comes from 20% of your clients, the truth is for most firms, your average client is actually not profitable. Wow. Yeah. So you're not even at profitability with your average client (laughs) because it tends to be the small subset of largest, whatever largest to us. But we're at least going to start there. From now on, you are not allowed to take anybody that's below the average line. You're only allowed to take anybody above the average line. Now, on top of this, you're going to have a capacity problem because if you want to do things for clients that are more affluent while you still got your staff working with clients that are less affluent, just you're going to hit a bottleneck around staff and capacity. Mm -hmm. So every time you add one above the line, you have to subtract one below the line. Now, you can decide how you want to do that. Nobody likes letting clients go. Yep. Right. I worked so hard to get them in the first place and to get here. It feels really, really scary. It's okay. Your revenue is going to go up. You add one below the line, subtract one. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. You add one above the line, subtract one below the line. You will, your, your revenue will go up. So you are, you are still going to be moving forward, but you're going to move forward in a way that doesn't create a capacity bottleneck for you. Yep. So you can do this right. lots of different ways. Like 
you can fire the client. I mean, usually the first few are easy because we all know like deep <laughs> down the subset of people like you see the name caught was so you see the name call up come up on caller ID. We don't have that as much anymore, but like you see the name call up a uh, come up for, for the phone call. And you're like, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so like you can start with them. They're the easiest to let go, but uh, you can just tell them that you don't want to work with them anymore. It's okay. You're allowed to. You can say that gradually, you know what? You don't, you've, we've come so far together. You don't need my services anymore. You're in a great place. I'm going to convert you to a retail account and I wish you the best mm -hmm. and moving on. Uh, you can refer it out to another advisor. Look, the truth is you're below average clients. Like you're not serving them the best anyways. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. You minimize how much time you spend with them because you're trying to spend uh, your time in other areas of the business that grow it. Somewhere out there is a younger, newer advisor who will treat them like a king or queen, right? Just yeah, that's fair. your C clients are somewhere else as A clients. I don't care where you are on the spectrum. Like yeah. that $10 million client is a cast off from someone at Goldman Sachs. Oh yeah. Or A client is someone else's C client. And you're like $100,000 client. Just I can't really do this very profitably given my staff and infrastructure. Some new advisor out there, like that mm -hmm. is gold. They're going to service the bejesus out of that client. To, to give them value because they don't have very many clients and that's meaningful revenue. So you can do the, the client. Trash, the head trash around some of this is that the, there's advisors that maybe don't believe that a client is there. Like you got yeah. it, you got to hold on to it. And even if you convince them logically, they're losing money or not profitable. The, the ability, because I think all, a lot of us advisors do this. We know something to be true, but why can't we do it? Like, why can't yep. we take action? Yep. So obviously accountability, community, all that's helpful. But what I hear you saying is like, you're not really posing this as a question. Like, this is true. The, just, yeah, this is true. I mean, the hardest thing to do in letting go of a client is just like, what, you know, nobody wants to see their client count and their revenue go backwards. Like, it doesn't have to. You only do this when you add a client above the line. Mm -hmm. So like every, your client count will not go down and your revenue will keep going up. You're still growing. You're still moving forward. But the cool thing is when you're doing it this way, you don't have to hire more people. <laughs> because your head count's not going up, mm. right? The total number of clients that need to be served is not going up. Just your revenue is otherwise known as how to scale a business. You get yes. more revenue without needing to add more costs and hire more staff. That's literally how it works. Yep. So I get that letting go of clients is scary. Now I've seen advisors that will say like, I'm all in on this and I've realized I'm past capacity. I'm going to take like my bottom 25 or 50 and I'm just going to do a block sale of a partial sale of my business to another advisor in the area, another advisor on my platform, whatever. Like you can, you can go harder and faster than if you want to. Most of us are not wired that way. Like take a little slower, just you're only allowed to take clients above the line. And every time you do, you have to let one go below the line. If you're ready to really play like the next level of the game, every time one comes on, two have to get off the bus. Yeah. From the bottom end. Now, if you're doing a good job of just only taking the ones that are above the line, I guarantee you there's still two below the line that are so far below the line that the one above the line actually is still a net increase in your right. revenue. Yep. So your income's always going up, but your work's going down. And what I see where I see most advisors get stuck at the end of the day is some version of too much work for too many clients for too little money, as Bill Backrack likes to say. Mm -hmm. And all of it comes down to we had this like un, no filter dynamic. If you can breathe, if you have a pulse and fog, a mirror, you're a client. And to be fair, a lot of us really need to do that at the very, very beginning because yeah, yeah. survival is really, really hard early on. But per the discussion around what got you here won't got, won't get you there. Look, there is a stage of the business where if they can fog a mirror is a reasonable way to grow and scale the business. Mm -hmm. And then there comes a point where it's not. And if you can't, per the discussion, if you can't change how you're showing up for your business to recognize it's changing needs, just that's the dynamic, that's the reality. Now, again, if this sounds awful to you, you love the segment that you work with and you just want to keep working with them, like that's cool. You're probably not going to be able to grow a lot further where you are. You're not going to necessarily be able to improve the economics of where you are because there's no like magic. If only I do this one magic thing, everything's like twice as profitable with the same clients. Like just that doesn't exist. Yep. You know, yep. fundamentals of business are unfortunately a, just a little bit more grounded to uh, uh, back to the practical costs and constraints of people and service and time. Yep. If you're at a happy place with the clients you serve, like more power to you. But if you're feeling that like too much work for too many clients for too little money, 
it always comes from, I have too many clients below the line. Yep. Yeah. We believe in the progression of awareness, understanding, belief. It's like, I, I just need to know that this business model is not sustainable. It got me where I am, but I need to change it. Okay. Practically, how do I go up market? And, and for me, I was a 20 something year old advisor, like relationship wasn't going to cut it. I just didn't know people with money. Yep. I didn't want to just do it over the next 20 years slowly, just by happenstance. Yep. That for us, we say the advisor is the product. Like the best way to go up market is to level up yourself. That yes, you can get in a room with a client that's worth ten million and bring something unique, and that is fully within your control. Well, absolutely. You know, again, part of the um, the productivity study that we're that we're working on right now, you know, we we found as we have in many other years as well, uh, you know, the just like the average CFP professional has significantly more affluent clients. The non-CFP professionals, just when you, you know, like when you're in the knowledge business, like you sell the knowledge between your two ears, like mm -hmm. the more you stock the shelves, <laughs> yes, the more you've got to sell. Like that's just kind of the dynamic yeah. of, yeah. of how it works. And so the more that you can do to invest in yourself and your knowledge, the more it lifts you up market, right? I mean, I, I went through a similar dynamic, like granted, I took it to an extreme because I'm a little hardcore this way. Like I went all in on degrees and designations in my 20s. I got a whole uh, alphabet soup after my name that goes with it. But without a doubt, like that was a very material driver for my ability to develop business mm -hmm. was not just the credibility that I had with the alphabet soup, but just I talked to prospects like I I show them things that they haven't heard from other advisors because I know more than other advisors. Yeah. And, you know, the the truth, like, I mean, you don't have to get the whole level of alphabet soup that I do. I mean, bear in mind, like, there's about 300,000 financial advisors. There are only 90,000 CFP certificates, and not all of those are even in practice because, like, some are retired and some are in academia and other places. So, like, if all you do is go out and get the CFP marks, you are literally ab above the average, like, significantly above the average. Yep. And then you can go deeper from there if you if you want to. So yes, like investing into yourself is what creates the knowledge base and the inventory to be able to sell more knowledge, to be able to command a higher fee for your time. That is ultimately what makes all of this work. But like the big but that goes with it is most of us aren't sitting around saying like, well, you know, I only work like 15 hours a week. I got so much spare time. Like I'm going to go create a whole, like I'm going to go use all this boring spare time to go amp up my education and then go fish for whale clients. Yep. Like we're drowning in our businesses and barely have time to keep our head above water. You probably listen to this podcast because you're like on a commute on the way to a client or you've managed to do a little bit of exercise for yourself or like you're mowing the lawn on the weekend. Mm -hmm. We like, it, it's hard to even find the time to make those level of investments, which is why to me, you can't talk about how and how you scale your business and how you improve the economics of your business and how you do that dynamic of moving up market without owning that you have too many unprofitable clients. And like, yeah. it's not that they're bad people. Again, somewhere, someone out there will serve them the way that they should be served, that they deserve to be served. Like this isn't a small people should be kicked to the curb kind of thing, which I know sometimes the industry puts on ourselves or is the, as you framed like the head trash that we sometimes get caught up in. Mm -hmm. Someone out there will service that client better than you. Yeah. And not because you're a bad person, but because you don't have the time to serve them because you got too many other clients and you're focusing where you're trying to focus. So do the client a kindness and get them to someone that will serve them the way that they should be served. Yeah. And they get upgraded and you get the capacity to then do the upgrading that you want to do to move to the next level. Yeah. And I think some advisors, and I struggled with this early on, that I was the, the, the best advisor for them. Like if I if I dropped them, their financial life would would fall apart. And it's like, they'll be okay. Like you have to know there's other great advisors out there and they will be okay. Well, well and, and, and candidly, like I, I mean, when I went through a version of this earlier in my career, like Look, I know how many bad advisors are are out there. Most of us, most of us do, and so like, I could not, in good conscience, ever turn a client away or even a prospect away. Cause I, like the image that it came to mind for me was like throwing them to the wolves. Just like that was, <laughs> that was the mental image that I yeah. had, luck, appropriate yeah. or not. Like they managed to like climb up the wall to safety, and I'm gonna like kick them off the wall and back into this like. <laughs> uh, 
uh, a flock of wolves sitting at the base that's like trying to nip at them. Like it was awful. I had really <laughs> negative uh, head trash around this. Yeah. So the only way that I could solve this was I had to find the advisor I was going to send them to. Oh, nice. So I, I, I networked in the area. Um, you know, the, the first time this cropped up to me, it was actually less on the client end and more on the prospect end that just, I, as I was growing my ability to do business development, I started growing more good. I started attracting more good clients and more not good fit clients as well. And I had so much trouble around, like, they found their way to me. Like, how can I like kick them back to the wolves at this point? Like what kind of horrible human being am I? Yeah. So, so I went on the website for Garrett Planning Network, which is the, the network for hourly advisors that works with kind of folks in that middle market. I found three Garrett advisors in the area. I took all three out to lunch one at a time. And I did my due diligence on them nice. to understand, like, is this someone in good faith that I could send clients to? Mm -hmm. And I found one where the answer was a very confident, yeah, like he knew his stuff. He'd done it for a long time. Uh, this was the market he was really focused on serving and doing good work for. Uh, he had a great service mentality, like everything I would want to see. And suddenly it didn't feel like a big deal hmm. to send the people out. All of a sudden I was like, you know what? Like, I'm going to send the client to Jim. First of all, client's going to get served really well by Jim because Jim's awesome. Second, I actually really like Jim now. So I actually just want to see Jim succeed in Jim's business because he's actually a good advisor. So like, I want to see this dude be successful. And yep. so suddenly I'm like, how many clients can I send to Jim? <laughs> because I'm talking to these people that are really not a good fit. And it went from, it feels awful to say no to these prospects because, you know, the kick them off the fence into the wolves uh, mental image. And into this, like, I'm helping the client and I'm helping Jim because Jim's really good and I want to see his business succeed. And he serves these people well. Like this, these you. are his, these are his people. So yeah. now Jim's winning, the client's winning, and I'm winning because I'm not taking on clients who aren't a good fit for the firm anymore. And over the years, it's just my my market and who I bring in has shifted. I've had to find other advisors over the years to say, here's I'm gonna, here's who I'm going to send the clients to now if they've got this situation and they're not a good fit or they've got that situation and they're not a good fit. That's good. Well, let's dive the last topic I want to jump into today is really the, the foundation of, and it's a shift I'm feeling, and we're, our, our coaching group's being called by some big firms. You, you would know them all. How do we teach advisors to understand and charge for their time? Like their, their time and ideas are valuable. It's not the product. They need to sell products. Pro products are necessary. AUM is necessary. Insurance is necessary. But this growing group of advisors that's saying, man, I give away a lot of time and energy for free in the hope of selling something. One, show me the potential of charging for my time. And then two, how do I, am I even worth it? Well, I mean, the potential for charging your time, like, I mean, it's there. It's not, it's not, I mean, it's not really a question if you want to look around just at the, uh, at the broader industry data, I mean, I, we live in the particular center of it because one of my companies, a company called Advice Pay, we literally process standalone financial planning fees, one-time fees and retainer fees for you know individual advisors and large enterprises. And it's like, I can tell you fees are out there being charged all over the place and growing really rapidly because we're literally the number one processor of all the fees nice. that are that are happening in the advisor space. I think we put through $300 million of standalone financial planning fees in the past four years. Uh, and, and we'll what do, the, what was the difference in this year to last year? What, what kind of growth rate are you seeing? Oh, probably 60 or 70% in fee volume this year. Wow. That's uh, cool. I mean, just numbers are enormous and growing now, you know, breaking that down to an individual advisor level, like the, the typical advisor retainer that we see is about three to $5,000 a year, Okay, which frankly is not that different from those of us who work in the mass affluent market and like a good client is a three or three to five hundred thousand dollar client at one percent is three to five thousand dollars. Like it's yeah. not actually that different. Now, as with the AUM world, there are folks that move up market. So there are people that are charging ten thousand dollar retainers and twenty thousand dollar retainers. The highest I the highest I've known is an advisor whose annual fee is a hundred thousand dollar annual retainer. And his pitch is, he, he works ultra, ultra high net worth. He does super deep estate planning work in particular, because, you know, you get that when you get people have like nine figure net worths and yeah. 10 figure net worths because they're literal billionaires. Yeah. And his pitch is basically like, you're going to pay me $100,000 a year. And once, about once every five to seven years, 
Uh, there's going to be a change in laws. I'm going to come up with an estate planning strategy that's going to save you tens of millions of dollars. Nice. I don't know what it's going to be, and I don't know when it's going to come. <laughs> it's but I've done this on a repeatable basis for the past 20 years, and that's why you're going to pay me. And people do. Nice. Because, again, fees are relative to wherewithal to pay. Now, I'm not paying him $100,000. <laughs> I think he's good, but I don't have 10-figure net worth problems. Yeah. But people who have 10-figure net worth problems, it's a it's a good deal. He's a yeah. steal of a deal. I mean, you're paying him $100,000 and he's saving him $10 to $20 million in taxes. Yeah, like, that's, what Mark that's a pretty, pretty good quantify. ROI. <laughs> yeah, if you can quantify the value of the idea, yeah. I think a lot of advisors, and I used to do this, you'd leave this kind of trust gap. You'd say, hey, good to meet you. Here's kind of what I do. I hope you like me. Let's work together. And I'm going to show you eventually that I'm, it was a good choice versus, hey, I'm going to meet you, be generous. And I'm going to show you up front that I've essentially just paid for myself. Then you, I mean, then the people that say no are people you don't even want. Well, and, and, and I mean, similar to you, that's why I went, I went fairly due with my career down a path of doing a lot of tax planning work in particular, because just, it is particularly quantifiable. Like just, right. I literally saved you this much dollar in taxes. Like we can do the math on the tax return. It's very straightforward. Yeah. So I will admit there's a, there's a particular appeal to do that. I don't think that's the only thing that you have to do, but it, 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 it is a nice angle. So look, like, it's not a question of whether you can charge fees. Like it's out there, it's being done. It's the fastest growing model that's out there if only because everybody else is pretty much already doing uh, uh, commissions and AUM fees. So retainer fees and, and planning fees is kind of the, ne the next big horizon that's growing. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think more practically the like, the challenge is not really whether you, like the, not, the challenge is not really whether you can, the challenge is whether you mm. can. Yeah. And it's happening. It's not a mystery. And that's the, the awareness part is like once we tell advisors, hey, there's advisors charging five grand a client and the clients are happy to pay it. You don't have to give all that time away for free. Then the issue is like, well, am I even worth it? Would they say yes to me? And that's just well, like a belief issue. Well, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I think, frankly, virtually all of it is a is a is a belief issue. And like, I don't mean that to be negative to anyone at all. Like our I mean, look, I, I started my career on the insurance side of the business 22 years ago. I was taught that I was not the value. That's right. My company's products and services were that. The value was that New England Life had a better variable universal life policy <laughs> than anybody else out there. Because I started in the New England. And if you didn't start at the New England, you want to challenge our VUL, come at me after this podcast. <laughs> right. We had a great product uh, and fantastic DI. Uh, so I was trained that my value was defined by the quality of my company's products. Mm -hmm. And I was at the New England because we had some really good product, particularly in the, the white collar market that New England had built their, built themselves in. So I was trained that the value is not me. The value is my company's products. And frankly, that made me feel really dependent on the New England. Cause you know, if I went to any other company, I wouldn't be able to sell their DI policy. So like, I gotta stay attached to New England. Uh -huh. When you move into the advice business, it is a fundamentally different business. My value is not the products that are being sold. I'm going to find you the thing, like I, because I, you know, got a great array of products that are out there. Everybody's architecture is going increasingly open. That means almost by definition, like my differentiator is not my product. My differentiator is me. Mm -hmm. If my differentiator is me and my value is me, for me, when I started making that that transition it gave me a freaking crisis of confidence. Just like, I mean, I still remember very clearly like sitting across from a client it was probably like a year and a half, two years into the business at his kitchen table. It was a, 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 a doctor. He'd saved up about $350,000 in his mid fifties. And this was almost 20 years ago. It's so like the, no, if three hundred fifty thousand dollars then was, even, was yeah. more than it is today, like that was, that was good money. That was a good client. Like back then, a hundred thousand dollar rollover was like amazing. <laughs> so this is like a three hundred fifty thousand. This was a really nice client, and he said he's getting ready to retire in another year or two, and he wanted to know like what should he do with this nest egg. He's like, this is everything I've got. Like I think it's enough. Mm -hmm. but I'm not sure what to do with it. That's why I've. You know, asking you to be my financial advisor. Oh. It's like, and so like he asked me that question. I'm like, the truth is I have no freaking idea. <laughs> Dude, do you realize I'm 23 years old and I was a psych major? Nice. Like, I have no, I, I mean, 
I know all my company trained me, I'm supposed to say, but like, dude, I have no idea. Yeah. Like, let's be honest. I, I don't know anything. <laughs> and so for me, that's what set me on this journey of, well, I got to get some like designations and degrees and learn what the heck I'm talking about. Like, yep. this is people's life. I mean, this is people's life savings. Like, mm -hmm. you can't screw this stuff up. Yeah. I mean, never mind even just like, I want to have enough expertise to be able to charge for my time. Like, this is people's life saying that you can't screw this stuff up. Like, you can just, you can literally destroy lives and families with this. Yeah. And so, from my end, like, that was what took me down this path of, well, and I got to get the degrees and designation. Like, just I have to learn my stuff so that I actually do know what I'm talking about so that I don't screw up this advice and like cause any harm. Mm -hmm. And along the way, it turns out like when you go learn a bunch of stuff, that's your inventory that you're selling. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that I was, you know, I was very comfortable to sell New England products because I knew we had a really good product. I had confidence to sell my value and charge fees for it because I know I got good stuff stocked on the shelf now. Yep. And so teacher, I know there's some folks that are just kind of the like fake it till you make it. They can totally roll with it and just get there. If that's you, you're probably not going to do the whole uh, study nerd out thing that I like to do. But at least for those that come from that direction, like I can't look someone in the face and charge them a $3,000, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 fee with a straight face. Mm -hmm. because I know deep, 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 deep down, like I really don't know that much. Like I'm really not sure I'm worth that fee. Yeah. Then the starting point is you have to invest into yourself, mm -hmm. stock the shelves, and then you've got some real knowledge to sell. That's great. And it turns yeah. out when you do people, people absolutely pay for it. Oh, yeah. It's not a question of whether they'll pay. Happ yeah. Happily. And they'll pay you again too. You're not just going to get them once and then you tricked them like this. Yes. So do it well. They're, they're, they're happy to have you on the team. Absolutely. Back to your point earlier that how much content you guys give away, like all these ideas live somewhere. Like it's not elusive. It's not just reserved for certain people. Yep. The only difference is the advisors that choose to go get it. Even if you just get enough to increase your confidence to, if I get a client to pay me a fee, I may not have every answer on day one, but I'm confident I can go find it. Well, if you're confident you can find it and they're confident you can find it, look, that's a value because the alternative is your fairly affluent client is like flipping around on the internet at two o'clock in the morning trying to find an answer to a question going, I make a lot of money and I pay people for a lot of things to do things for me. Why on earth am I doing this myself on the internet? Like, you know, delegators want to delegate. There's mm -hmm. a reason why those have historically been our clients. And yes, a part of delegating is I just hope you have the answer. But a part of delegating is like, I don't need you to have all the answers. I need you to be able to get all the answers. And I need to be confident that when you get the answer, it's going to be the right one when you bring it back to me. Yep. And that is more than sufficient as, as a service. Now, when you've got some of the answers, it's nice as well, because you can't convince them you can find answers unless you have at least a few of them. Absolutely. So. There, there is a, there is like a little bit of a minimum bar there, but you still don't have to have every single answer. I don't have every answer for uh, particularly complex client situations that come up because look like they're so freaking complex. No yeah. one has the answer. Like that's why they're seeking us out to be their advisor. Like these are questions that no one's answered before. That's, that's right. part of the virtue in, of continuing to move up market. But all of that is built around, yes, they will pay, but you have to have the capacity to take them which yep. is why one-on-one -on -one off matters. The more affluent they are, the more complex their problems are and the more financial wherewithal they have to pay for the problem. I guess that's a little fair. Folks with not a lot of money also have some complexity in their lives as well. Mm -hmm. But people up market have complexity and a financial ability to pay you very well for it, yep. which is where right. getting more dollars per hour comes from, whether you literally charge hourly or not. And that's where the, the scalability effect comes. You don't have to go all the way to multi-bajillionaires, but- any up market move relative to where you are will create scalability for your business. If you take one on above the line and remove one below the line and yep. just repeat that process over time. That's great, man. That's powerful. Well, you've successfully become the longest uh, podcast episode we have so far. Yes. So we'll, uh, we'll have you back Fantastic. on to beat your own record later. Awesome. Awesome. Appreciate the opportunity. I, I, I hope this is helpful food for thought for, for everyone in, in how to grow or get a little bit more scalability around the, around the business. Again, I just would note though, cause I know like someone's going to listen to this and their takeaway is going to be like, Oh, apparently we're all supposed to work with like deca bajillionaires or, yeah. or bust. Like 
this is all relative. Look, if, you, if you're working with clients that have two and $300,000, if you can get to clients that average a half a million dollars by doing one-on-one -on -one off and stocking yourselves a little bit more to have value for them, you'll see a material increase in your practice and metrics. If you're working with millionaires, the math works when you go to two millionaires. If you're working with five millionaires, the math goes to 10 millionaires. And what you'll find is if you take one of those steps, rarely do you stop there. Like you got from the 300s to the 500,000s, then you get from the 500s to the 750s, then you get from the 750s to the millions. And you move on down the line. Show me any firm today that's got million dollar minimums. 10, 20 years ago when they started, they had a hundred thousand right. dollar minimum. They didn't launch it that way out of the gate. You get there as a progression over time. But just understanding that the path to productivity is getting paid more for your time mm -hmm. from people who can afford to pay you for your time and stocking your shelves with enough val enough knowledge that you got things that they'll pay for. Yep. I think every advisor wants to have a bigger impact on people, their clients, the world. They want more time to do things they enjoy, their family, they want to travel. We don't just all want to create a bigger job for ourselves over time. Yep. And we'd like to make more money along the way. And the only way to do that is for your practice to evolve and innovate and change. And we have to be open Absolutely. to that. Absolutely. Well, otherwise, you get you get stuck when you stop being willing to change. No doubt. All right, my friend. Thanks, buddy. Awesome. Thank you, Sten. Well, on behalf of Stan, myself, and our entire Elite Advisor Network community, we want to thank Michael for stopping by the show and recording perhaps his shortest podcast episode ever. Seriously, though, Michael paved the way for us to do what we do in working with advisors, and we're forever grateful for him sharing his platform with us just a few years ago. If you're not subscribed to our show, we release episodes every week, and they're always practical and to the point. And in addition, if you haven't left a review of the show, we're sending out a copy of Sten's book to anyone who leaves a review of the show this month, January of 2023. So leave a review and send a screenshot of your posted review to me, Andy at eadvisornetwork.com. That's Andy at eadvisornetwork.com, along with your mailing address, and we'll send you a copy of Sten's latest book if we get that review in January of 2023. On behalf of Sten and myself, Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself and that life's too short to choose the average path. Choose the elite one. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you.